What does it mean to be the strongest captain of the Gote 13? Strongest is, after all, such a nebulous term. Is it the character with just the most physical strength? Is it the one that's the most intelligent or the most experienced? The one with the most versatile and powerful Zan Pakto? Or is it a combination of all these things and more, as even these individual factors themselves can't be pinned down so easily? In today's video, we're going to be ranking the end of series captains, so that's the Gote 13 as they appear in chapters 685, 686, and the Hell chapter, from overall weakest to strongest, based on what we know of them from the source material available to us. In doing so, we'll be evaluating them based on everything that makes a captain worthy of wearing that white Hayori. Their individual strength, their intelligence, their overall experience and maturity, their personality, their battle prowess, as well as their Zan Pakto, its own powers and abilities, and the character's capabilities and feats as showcased in the story itself. Basically, it's a coming together of all facets that make up a captain. This is actually something of a follow-up to a video I made three years ago where I attempted to calculate a similar ranking, but after being able to have something of a rethink, well, I'm back to try it again. So, without further delay, let's get started. But before we get started on the video, guys, if you haven't hit subscribe yet, make sure to do that now for more Bleach content like this every single week. And if you enjoyed the video, when you're done with it, make sure to give it a thumbs up as well to help show your support for me and the channel. And if you want to support me that extra step further, I do also have a Patreon as well. And as always, I just want to say an enormous shout out and a huge thank you to everyone supporting me over there on Patreon. I really do appreciate it. And of course, as you might expect from a video looking at the end of series captains, there will be major spoilers for the thousand year blood war arc of bleach to follow. Many of the same issues plague these captains on the lowest rung. A lack of genuinely meaningful screen time, very little being known about their combat capabilities, and an unshakable sense that they're really only here because they have to be. Because they're taking the place of stronger but now deceased captains. Originally occupying the lowest spot on this list and the dubious honour of worst captain of the Gote 13 was the 4th Division's Isane Kotetsu, but that is not the case this time around. I feel like giving her that spot was doing her something of an unfair disservice, and I overlooked what skills she has actually showcased in the story. A captain who has never showcased any real skills at all is Tetsu Zaimon Iba, the captain of the 7th division and my newest pick for worst captain of the lot, or the overall weakest captain. Poor Iba, he's definitely one of the strangest characters in Bleach in regards to his portrayal. Kubo has no qualms, implying that Iba is a perfectly capable and competent soldier, but he always stops just short of actually showing us why. Originally jumping ship from the 11th division because he didn't have what it took to climb the ladder there, seeking a promotion in order to please his overbearing mother, Eber seems to have settled forevermore in the 7th division instead. But even here, under Komamura's command, Eber has to be motivated to stand and fight on two separate occasions. Eber's Shikai is a total mystery to us. Oh, we've seen it a few times before, sure, but we don't know its name, nor if it has any special abilities to speak of. The extent of Eber's fights have either been completely off-screen or just non-existent. The only enemy Eber has ever successfully hit in Bleach is actually just Ikaku, and at that point they were actually allies. In the Thousand Year Blood War arc, Eber doesn't fight a single character and then takes up the mantle of Captain by the end. Sure, his dedication, fortitude and attitude towards training and improving himself are commendable, and he's humble enough to realise he barely qualifies for the role, but just that alone doesn't make for a good Captain. The best you can really say about Eber is that he's loyal. No one is going to say Komamura was the strongest or best captain of the Gote 13, but his replacement is a definite step down. And then up next is the aforementioned captain of the 4th Division, Isane Kotetsu. Despite suffering from many of those same issues as Iba before her, there's something to be admired about Isane. She's got gumption. 
Where Iba often runs in the opposite direction, I always appreciated Isane actively trying to engage with both Aizen and Rudborn during their brief confrontations. It's not the sort of ferocity or tenacity you'd expect from her, but it's welcome all the same and adds a fiery facet to the character that's not often seen, even if it does come across as a little reckless sometimes. Like Iba before her, Isane never really gets to fight anyone either. The closest she really comes is being knocked out cold by Ichigo in a single hit during the Soul Society arc. Even when she comes face to face with a stern Ritter in Gwenael Lee, it's Yachiru who takes basically the reins of the entire fight. But Isane isn't meant to be a fighter. She's meant to be a healer. And as a member of the medical division, Isane actually does get opportunities to shine in the areas that she should be excelling at. Her healing prowess has been shown to us numerous times, such as when she revived the near-dead Rukia in the Arankar arc, and when she worked worked tirelessly to try and stabilise the comatose Rose and Kensei during the second Quincy invasion. And she, alongside Ukitake and Hanataro, performed surgery and healing in the middle of the battlefield on injured fighters like Kenpachi, Hisagi, Ikaku and more, preparing them for their journey to the Royal Palace during the war's endgame. Isane Zanpakuto at least has a name, Itegumo, and from that name we can discern it might be an ice type, but again it's never actually utilised. There's definitely an immaturity to Isane still, and she has a lot of growing to do. For example, as the Gote's premier healer, she needs to learn self-confidence and have pride in her abilities and skills, as they are so valuable to the Gote on the whole, but it's likely, I think, that the death of her mentor, Unohana, will force her down that road entirely. Time if it hasn't already. The Vizards get a bad rap in Bleach, and everyone knows it. The situation is so bad, in fact, that it gets difficult to truly determine how skilled and competent they really are. Characters like Rose, Kensei, and others should be a lot stronger than they appear, but we can only really go off what we've seen and experienced in the story ourselves. All logic dictates that these characters are powerful warriors, but all of their on-screen appearances completely fly in the face of that. That's why the captain of the 8th division, Lisa Yadamaru, retains her position as third from the bottom. As a former vice captain over a hundred years ago, Lisa was already in a high-ranking position even before her hollowfication, and was strong to the point where her captain, Kyoraku Shinsui, who himself is extremely wise and perceptive, had great faith in her abilities. That being said, Lisa is definitely one of the Vizard with the least amount of face time with the audience, and she never really gets a proper display of her skills. Her Zanpakuto, Hagaro Tonbo, is for the most part a complete unknown. Does it just hit things really hard, or is there more to it than that? I like its design at least, and it seems to relate to ultra-fast and precise sword swipes and slashes, but we never get any more than that. That being said, I mean, she's clearly a superior fighter to the two preceding her on the list as she effortlessly wipes out Menos Grande's soldiers, manages to survive against a hollow-fired Ichigo, and holds her own against the third Espada Haribel. Though that last fight is admittedly weird in how very little of it we actually see. As with Iba before her, Lisa becomes a captain in the same arc in which she does the absolute least, stepping up to face Gerard Valkyrie, only to be taken out of the war with a single hit. Yes, Gerard is immeasurably powerful, but almost every character who gets pummeled by him manages to keep standing or fighting to some degree, so why couldn't the Vizard? Alright, now with effectively the lowest tier of captains out of the way, we start to traverse muddier waters. Up next, we've got the captain of the 9th division, Kensei Mugaruma, and yes, another Vizard. As a captain from a hundred years ago, it's reasonable to expect Kensei to be stronger than Lisa, but like Lisa, Kensei gets very little opportunity to really do much of anything. Despite having his position restored in the present day, Kensei is heavily underutilised in the Thousand Year Blood War arc, and his character suffers from being almost completely broken down to the point where it just becomes kind of sad. But let's start with the good. Kensei's authoritative drill sergeant personality is great for whipping the recruits of his division into shape, and I've always appreciated his brutal, no-nonsense attitude to fighting. 
For a series filled to the brim with battles drenched in pomp and circumstance, Kensei is refreshingly straightforward, almost always immediately activating Bankai in order to get the job done as efficiently as possible. That being said, to me at least his Bankai doesn't impress. Tekken Tachikaze seems very limited in scope to me, and while he does soundly defeat the same masked masculine who put Hisagi, Ikaku and Yumichika in the ground, he then gets ruthlessly and almost embarrassingly destroyed mere moments later. Yes, the Master Masculine fight is a strange one in general, and I can't help but think the Vizards were merely offered up as sacrificial lambs in a fight they were never going to win, just to help increase the fanfare around Renji's arrival, but still, the point stands. You know, on a slight tangent, I've always wondered if the captains ever discussed the war in detail during its aftermath, because comparing themselves and their output to their colleagues, I'd be surprised if Kensei and Rose could really show their faces around Seireite again for fear of humiliation. When you have characters like Mayuri carrying the entire war effort on his back, and Kensei and Rose can't defeat a single Sturmiter together, only to then die and even go so far as to serve the enemy in death, the divide becomes clearer than ever. With a fairly simplistic Zanpak toe in Tachikaze and a very poor track record, Kensei's weaknesses are clear. Even if, like I said, I think he has the right mentality for the position, and his skill in vicious hand-to-hand -hand combat is evident throughout the story. Acting as almost the polar opposite to Kensei, we have the captain of the third division, Rojuro Rose Otoribashi, whose flowery, whimsical ways might not immediately make him seem like the best choice for the role. Unlike Kensei, who is a picture of efficiency, Rose is determined to turn battle into art, preferring theatrics to pragmatism. Much like his fellow Vizard, Rose doesn't get too many opportunities to shine, suffering almost the exact same fate as Kensei himself in the Quincy Blood War, with both of them being severely wounded, killed, and later turned into slaves. I actually quite like Rose personally, but his weaknesses are obvious. Despite his experience, he too was a captain a hundred years prior, though newly promoted at the time, Rose's attempts to pontificate on the battlefield and his big mouth in general expose a subtle arrogance that gets the better of him. Rose is often cited as being perhaps one of the most egregious examples of a character in Bleach unnecessarily explaining their powers to their enemy and completely giving the game away, resulting in their loss. It's a trope the series suffers from en masse, but perhaps never quite to this degree, and never with quite such immediate and devastating consequences. Rose, using his Bankai, manages to actually put Mask the Masculine on the ropes, the same version of Mask who just obliterated Kensei, but basically tells the Sternritter how to disable his Bankai, and so Mask does just that, before giving Rose a frankly well-deserved blasting. So, I mean, yeah, that's all pretty bad. Despite all of that, though, why is Rose ranked higher than Kensei? In my opinion, it all comes down to his Zanpak toe. Kinshara just seems to be a far superior Zanpak toe to the limited Tach Kaze. Not only does Kinshara have the element of range, but it seems to have access to a variety of different techniques. Though we only get to see one, Kinshara Sonata number 11, the numbered element means it's reasonable to believe Rose has a plethora of skills under his belt. Then there's his Bankai, Kinshara Butodan, which is actually really powerful. By playing a melody with his sinister dance troupe, Rose produces musical illusions that are so potent the enemy believes them to exist, and as soon as they believe in them, those illusions become reality. So in the example we get, Mask believes he is on fire, and so he burns as a result. Had Rose not told Mask the secret to victory, that he needs to be able to hear his Bankai for it to work, it's highly possible that Rose would have pushed the Sturmiter way beyond where he was. While I don't know if Rose could have actually won the fight, the true capabilities of his Bankai are also unknown, though I do think Kubo teases what he can ultimately do. Rose says that if his deceptions capture Mask's heart, they can burn his body and even stop his breath, before preparing to use a power called Einhelden Lieben, or a hero's life, which feels like a bespoke power designed for use against Mask himself, which would ultimately 
stop his breath, and take his life. If Rose's Barnkai is able to create bespoke songs tailored to his enemies, then that's a whole nother thing, but that's all speculation on my part. Regardless, for all of Rose's failings, he has a pretty impressive weapon at his disposal. Up next, we have the captain of the second division, Soifon, who feels like a difficult character to place in the tumultuous post-thousand year blood war arc world. While Soifon has had a bit of, what was in my opinion, extremely necessary growth since the Iran Kar arc, particularly emotionally, she's actually quite neglected in the Thousand Year Blood War when compared to the rest of her colleagues who have carried over from the days of the Soul Society arc. Now, I used to be of the opinion that she didn't even deserve to hold the rank of captain at all after her embarrassingly childish display during the fake Karakura Town battle where she refused to cooperate with Hachi, basically just due to his association with Urahara. But thankfully, we've almost moved past that now. She's definitely changed somewhat. Soifon now shows a willingness to work with her vice-captain Omaida during desperate situations, but still routinely embarrasses herself in front of other captains with immature outbursts. Even if I kind of agree with her and the situation does demand an answer, as it did with the Zero Division, Soifon as a captain should know better than to simply throw a tantrum about it, especially to Shinigami who are effectively her superiors. On the plus side, Soifon has always been a very skilled combatant, and after mastering her Shunko, has closed some of the gap between her and her mentor, Yoroichi. However, I mentioned she was neglected in the final arc, and it's true. Her mastery of Shunko is about the extent of any kind of a boost that she receives, and it's rendered useless almost immediately. When actively compared with characters who are receiving dedicated training from the Zero Division and the like, it's not hard to feel like she's been left behind. Plus, she'll forever be saddled with a virtually useless Bankai, so that's a bit of a shame. Those points aside, Soifon still has many things going for her. Unbelievable speed, incredible Hakuda prowess, and a deadly Shikai to try and make up for that Bankai. Plus, she's something of a bastion for staunch Soul Society traditionalism in a post-Yamamoto Gote, and remains an ardent defender of the law, upholding the ancient truths of what it means to be an officer of the Gote 13. Whether that's truly good or not, I suppose is up to the individual. Jumping three places up the list from the previous video is the newly promoted captain of the 13th division, Rukia Kuchki. Her improved standing is well-deserved, and was a definite mistake on my part originally. Of course, we've spent a ton of time with Rukia over the span of the series, but that just means we've been privy to her own journey of growth. During the Iran Kar arc, she overcame her own incredible emotional torment to be the first to kill an Espada, and then later in the Thousand Year Blood War arc, after having received divine training at the hands of the Zero Division, she defeats her brother Spectre and restores honour to the Kuchki family. Rukia becoming a captain, much like her promotion to vice-captaincy in the Lost Agent arc, was a simple case of when, not if. After the hardship she's endured, the training she's undergone, it was honestly a given by the series' end. Rukia, along with Renji, is one of Ichigo's close-knit friends who actually manages to retain some relevance going into the final battle, which is a feat in itself, and in doing so, manages to successfully outclass a number of captain-level characters in terms of her output during the war. Admittedly, taking over from Ukitake was always going to be a daunting task, but Rukia already has the adoration and devotion of her division, a powerful Zanpakuto of which she has now unlocked its true strength, and a vast amount of experience on the battlefield. The last time we saw her use it, her Bankai, while dangerous, still needed refining. She still needed to spend time with it to get to know it and to better understand how to wield it without injuring herself, but that will come with time. In fact, it's highly possible that by chapter 685, after the time skip that's occurred before that, she's come a long way towards mastering her Bankai, but we unfortunately don't know that for sure. Much like her brother, Rukia is something of an all-rounder Shinigami. While never particularly excelling at any aspect of Shinigami combat in her youth, I'd argue that served her well now, enabling her to be skilled in a variety of different elements, including both swordplay and Kido. I feel like an argument could be made for Rukia placing a spot below this, she and Soifon seem maybe interchangeable to me, 
but at the same time I feel good having Rukia at the midpoint of the list. She definitely deserves it and has the potential to reach even higher in the future. The captain of the 5th division, Shinji Hirako, is another tough one to pin down. Although the butt of a running joke on this channel about how useless he is, the reality is that Shinji, like his fellow Vizards, should be an extremely powerful asset to the Gote on the whole. Interestingly, I'd argue that despite his prominence in the story and his position as the de facto leader of the Vizards, Shinji gets less screen time dedicated to actual battling than his counterparts, which again makes this very tricky. And so, let's begin elsewhere instead. In terms of his personality, his maturity, and his approach to the role, Shinji is a frankly great captain. He was there over a hundred years ago, even advising Kisuke Urahara on how best to interact with and command his subordinates, and in the present day he's forged a healthy relationship with his vice-captain Hinamori Momo, to the point where she now looks up to and respects him. Why is this such a big deal, you might ask? Surely that's something of a prerequisite for most decent captains. Well, Hinamori has suffered at the hands of her captain more than most, to the point where her mental state was severely fractured as a result of Aizen's manipulations. And who better to resonate with than another of Aizen's victims? Shinji takes Hinamori under his wing, fostering her growth and helping her to become who she's meant to be. Not only that, but we see the leader in Shinji when he acts as a mediator between the Gote 13 and the Vizards, helping to temper hostilities between the two factions and instead unite them against a common foe. So he's got the right stuff to be a captain, certainly to the point where I argued he could be a potential head captain candidate. It's just such a shame that his battle prowess is so shrouded in obfuscation. His Zanpakuto, Sakanade, and its Bankai, Sakashima, Yokushima, Hapo, Fusagari, are both pretty incredible, to the point where his Bankai is actively banned within the Seireite due to how dangerous it can be. Shinji was the first person to land an actual hit on Aizen in the story, and dominated an admittedly base form and one-armed Grimjo, using a combination of his Zanjutsu talents and his hollow powers. So while I'm content with keeping Shinji out of the overall top five, I still think he's a very well-rounded member of the captaincy who just needs that dedicated battle to really show off what he's capable of. So as we enter the top five, this is where the list might become contentious, though I'm still happy with it overall. In fifth place, we've got the captain of the 10th division, Toshiro Hitsugaya. A prodigy, Hitsugaya has almost everything going for him. Despite his age and relative inexperience in the grand scheme of things, he's well-liked, whip-smart, and commands respect within his division. I'd argue, in fact, that he and Matsumoto have one of the strongest foundations of all captain and vice-captain relationships within the Gote. I've mentioned it before, but Hitsugaya feels like a true force for pure good within the Seireite, and that's reflected in the division he leads. Much like Soifon, Hitsugaya used to have a real problem with his temper, often allowing himself to be easily manipulated, with his anger spilling over to the point where it clouded his decision-making and even nearly got him killed. Unlike Soifon, however, there's no evidence of that anger or immaturity in the Thousand Year Blood War arc, and Hitsugaya feels like he's completed a meaningful developmental journey in the final arc. His ice and snow type Zanpakuto Hyorin Maru remains one of the series' most incredible, with a true volley of special abilities at its beck and call, and of course one of the most versatile Bankai in Bleach with Daiguren Hyorin Maru. So, where's the problem? Honestly, there isn't really one, but when you compare Hitsugaya to the remaining captains on the list, he nearly always falls short in one area or another, whether it is experience or cunning or pure raw strength. Hitsugaya is extremely capable, but I mean, so are those yet to come, and there's evidence in Hitsugaya's own fights that he himself isn't quite ready for the big time just yet. Just look at his adult form. Adult Hitsugaya, the result of the mature Daiguren Hyorin Maru, only exists because Hitsugaya's body has to be forcibly aged to the point where Hyorin Maru thinks he can handle the newfound power. So age still isn't on Hitsugaya's side. Sure, his current Bankai is impressive, but his true strength lies just out of reach. If he has to wait for his icy petals to shatter before he can access that power every time, then he's taking a huge gamble. 
Not every fight will be as drawn out as the battle against Gerard, for example. Again, it's currently impossible to know if Hitsugaya can access that power faster as of the Hell chapter, but considering unlocking his strength seemed to be really just based on age predominantly, I think it's unlikely. By the time Hitsugaya has actually aged to the point where adult Hitsugaya becomes simply Hitsugaya, then we'll be looking at a totally different scenario. One that probably lets Hitsugaya jump at least another two spaces on this list, perhaps. But for now, this is where he sits, and I'm alright with that. Mayuri Kurotsuchi, the deranged captain of the 12th division, is probably the hardest captain to rank on this list. He doesn't play by the rules, it's as simple as that. Mayuri is a genius and by far the smartest member of the current Gote 13. His inventions, innovations and strategy helped the Gote 13 win the war against the Vandenreich in more ways than one, and he's often been described as the MVP of the entire battle. Mayuri's growth has been clear to see. He started out the series as a homicidal maniac, without question the worst captain to serve under, who gleefully experimented with the lives of everyone around him. Friend or foe, it didn't matter. Everyone was simply material to Mayuri. But over time, he's mellowed out somewhat and actively saves the lives of numerous captain-level Shinigami throughout the battle against the Quincy. In fact, it's in this war that Mayuri seems to truly come into his own, and although he's never really answered for his many crimes, he certainly seems to act more altruistically than he used to. Now he's very much fighting for the wider good of the Soul Society, even if it's born out of the fact that he doesn't want to be wiped out along with everything else. So, from a personable standpoint, Mayuri isn't what I would consider a good captain. The fact he's a captain at all is probably questionable, but he's a necessary evil that the Soul Society is more than willing to use as their tool, but that's not what makes him difficult to rank. In fact, if this list were based just on that, he'd probably be rock bottom. But no, Mayuri's many scientific exploits render him almost impossible to gauge alongside his comrades in terms of his actual strength and capability. Mayuri has an answer for everything. As revealed in the Thousand Year Blood War arc, he knows the Bankai of every single captain and even has samples of all their blood at his disposal. Considering his newly modified Bankai, yes, he really can upgrade his Bankai like it was a new phone, allows him to counter an enemy based on preconceived information, the fact he knows what everyone else is already capable of is a terrifying prospect, to the point where it feels like Myri could kind of dangle that over anyone's head if he needed some leverage. And so, in an almost meta way, Myri perfectly suits being this high on the list. And despite him being a character that I really do like, I don't necessarily like him being this high up because he's a cheat, essentially, and he certainly doesn't deserve to be here if you take his many offences into account. But he's here nonetheless because he's made it so, and he knows it. He knows the Gote 13 needs him just as he needs to be this high on the list for it to really make sense. Mayuri is one of those characters who could feasibly be defeated by almost any of these captains, but in turn could almost certainly defeat almost any of them. Even if Zaraki, for example, does have the greatest physical strength of any captain, what does it matter against a captain who can preemptively alter his very properties in under an hour to combat virtually any situation? So yes, Mayuri is a weird and tough one, and he's just going to have to go here for now, as I like to think the top three picks contain elements of all these ranking factors and meet the criteria in a way that Mayuri simply can't muster. As the perfect all-rounder captain and a role model Shinigami for those serving in the Gote 13 beneath him, it only seems fitting to begin the top three with the captain of the 6th division, Byaki Akuchiki. Perhaps the most clear-cut candidate for the role of head captain were Kyoraku to die, Byaki represents both the steadfast traditions of the Soul Society gone by and a new age, an age that's been transformed and rewritten by their interaction with Ichigo Kurosaki, of whom no captain was quite affected like Byakia. After much soul-searching, Byakia has reforged his relationship with his vice-captain Renji into one of the strongest bonds the Gote has seen, and thanks to both of them receiving divine training in the Zero Division, he now leads perhaps the Gote's strongest division overall. 
Byakia is the ever-reliable face of the strength of Soul Society and his mastery of all four of the Shinigami arts only further reinforces that. Kubo chose Byakia to be viciously savaged in the first Quincy invasion for a few reasons, but crucially, it's because he best represents the Soul Society itself in its pride, in its power, in its link to Ichigo. Byakia has shades of Soifon's stiff upper lip, but without any of the immaturity. In fact, Byakia is one of the most measured captains of all, rarely losing his cool under any form of pressure. Byakia also boasts one of the greatest track records of the entire story. By my count, he's defeated Ichigo, Renji, Zomari, Yami, Tsukishima, Candice, Robert, and Nanana, while lending a supporting hand in the defeats of Aznod and Pepe. It's a frankly nearly unmatched record save for one of the captains left on this list, although they're very similar. All of this stems from Byakia's own incredible skill, and of course his all-encompassing Zan Park To, Senbon Zakura and its Bankai, Senbon Zakura Kagiyoshi, which has multiple stages to it and provides Byakia with both the ultimate sword and the ultimate shield, which he then combines with best-in-class speed and an incredible mastery of Kido. Byakia's training at the hands of the Zero Division has only taken him to further illustrious heights, turning the ideal Shinigami into one of the Gotei 13's truly undisputed powerhouses, capable of defeating multiple Captain Class enemies at once, without taking so much as a scratch of damage. Now, I've long said that the paths taken by Byaki Akuchiki and the captain of the 11th division, Kenpachi Zaraki, were designed to be extremely similar. Despite their outward differences, they're reflective of one another, each one representing the purest and most powerful aspects of the Gote 13 and the wider Soul Society. You see it in their interactions with Ichigo, right the way through to their respective roles in the Thousand Year Blood War arc. And it's for that reason, and a myriad of others, that I'm content with putting them in both the third and second spots respectively on this list. If this list were based on pure physical strength alone, then of course Kenpachi would take the top spot as the strongest unquestionably. The same is true if looking squarely at how much Ryoku each captain possesses. Kenpachi has an unquenchable well of power to draw from that has only increased over time. His combat prowess is notable enough that the Vandenreich considered him a special war power, and thanks to the arc he undergoes in the Thousand Year Blood War, he now also has a Shikai and a Bankai to his name too, no Zarashi. Kenpachi definitely still has room to grow. The last time we saw his Bankai, it ruptured his body, a body that clearly wasn't yet honed or prepared for such power. Not only that, but upon returning from his battle with Unahana, I thought Kenpachi had changed and would begin wielding his title with the responsibility and weight it deserved. But he quickly reverted back to a swing first, ask questions later, mindless, thoughtless lover of battle as soon as the final showdown rolled around. So there is still room for growth and change here. But Kenpachi ticks nearly all the other boxes from being enormously powerful to commanding the respect of his men, turning a band of savages, bandits and thugs into a cohesive unit that the Gote can be proud of. Unsurprisingly, the 11th division is at the forefront of the battle against the Quincy's and Kenpachi himself is highly involved from the very beginning. He obviously packs the experience necessary, and his Zanpak To, while very simplistic in nature, is one of the strongest in the series, physically at least. Unlike Mayuri, who clearly began to act out of concern for the wider Soul Society, that same bigger picture that Urahara is always in pursuit of, it's difficult to tell if Kenpachi ever truly made that same emotional leap. I think he might have. This scene in particular always made me think he was finally not just fighting for himself or his own amusement, but out of at least some burgeoning sense of duty, or at least affection towards his soul society that the enemy had so thoroughly trampled. That scene is meant to be a coming together of the disparate elements and natures that make up the Gote 13 from all walks of life, and in his own way, that's Kenpachi acknowledging that he's a part of it too. That scene is supposed to showcase that no matter who they are or where they come from, they're all united under one cause, a desire to defend their home and the people within it. 
and that is, in my eyes at least, the purest form of duty that these soldiers can find. But at the end of the day, Kenpachi is undeniably a monster and an asset that the Gote 13 can't afford to lose. Where Byakuya is an all-rounder who is competent in a variety of different areas, Kenpachi puts everything he has into being the ultimate blunt force object. Though that's not to say he's stupid, because he's not. He's actually rather intelligent, he just almost prefers not to use it and to go into battles swinging wildly. And with a track record just as impressive as Byakuya's before him, if not more so, considering the trail of bodies left in this captain's wake, Kenpachi Zaraki is the paragon of pure power among the Gote 13. But for me, the top spot remains the same as it did three years ago, and it goes to none other than the captain of the first division and captain commander of the Gote 13, Kyoraku Shinsui, which I guess makes sense as clearly the best person to lead the Shinigami. Kyoraku both reveres the traditions of Soul Society and rejects them, with his unorthodox and progressive style of leadership challenging the conventions that have kept the Gote 13 rigid, unmoving, and stale for a thousand years. As arguably the second most intelligent captain behind Mayuri, and certainly the most perceptive and world-weary, Kyoraku has the ability to see the truth of things in a way that others simply can't. A deceptively dangerous individual, Kyoraku joins the ranks of characters like Kisuke in his dogged determination to protect the bigger picture of the Seireite through any means necessary. In some respects, Kyoraku reminds me a little bit of a superior version of Byakuya in terms of his capabilities. He's a proven all-rounder with the added bonuses of age, wisdom, a wealth of experience, that almost uncanny skill at perceiving the world around him and those in it for what they really are, and of course, a totally broken Zanpak toe. Even before the Thousand Year Blood War arc, which is where Kyoraku really came into his own and was very quickly portrayed by Kubo as leadership material where the rest were not, Kyoraku was a mentor to those around him, assuaging both Shinji and Kisuke's personal fears and concerns a hundred years ago, and even identifying and trying to contain their weak link in Hitsugaya when in the midst of battle with Aizen. As the surrogate son of Yamamoto himself, Kyoraku has always been held to a lofty standard, and the burden of leadership falling on his shoulders doesn't so much just change him as it does reveal the sinister pragmatic tactician lying in wait underneath his flowery facade. And that takes me back to that idea of Kyoraku being willing to win through any means necessary. Perhaps the single most dangerous aspect of his character, which, when combined with everything else we've talked about regarding Kyoraku, makes him truly the strongest captain in my eyes. You see, where someone like Ken Pachi fights to enjoy himself, Kyoraku fights to get results. When someone as powerful and as dangerous as Kyoraku comes to the realisation that war is evil and that there's nothing so foolish as honour to be found in it, then he's unshackled. Kyoraku doesn't get as many fights as some of the captains on this list, but thanks to the combination of his willingness to fight dirty and a ridiculous Zanpak toe in Katen Kyokotsu and its Bankai Katen Kyokotsu Karamatsu Shinju, he's able to achieve incredible feats of power and skill, killing the first Espada with just his Shikai while pushing the godlike leader of the Schutzstoffel to his second and final form, all while fighting him alone. Kyoraku Zanpakuto is almost limitlessly versatile, with a children's game for almost every occasion, and a Bankai that leads to nearly certain death. In that sense, Kyoraku has it all, which again is why I guess he's the best choice to be head captain right now. Not only is Kyoraku incredibly clever, but he's dangerous and unpredictable when in a pinch, able to make and shoulder the hard decisions necessary of him in order to survive. It's through his leadership that the Soul Society adapts to and emerges victorious in the greatest war of their time, after all. But Kyoraku's dark and dour demeanour is only one half of the character, and while it's that version of him that's required during the war, Kyoraku has also proven himself to be warm, kind-hearted and understanding. That perception of his, allowing him to appreciate Chad's drive and ambition to fight for his friends, to spare him, where Nanao would not, and to even potentially question the seeming concrete truth of the matter surrounding Aizen's murder. And then, even beyond that, his otherwise colourful and easygoing personality makes him fun and likeable to those serving under him, while he remains respected and admired by most. 
At the end of the series, based on all of the factors involved, it's clear to me that Kyoraku is the strongest captain in the Gotei 13, the strongest if strength here looks at what the character is capable of in full, and includes everything we mentioned at the top of the video. His intelligence, maturity, power, skill, wisdom, experience, and yes, even hacks. Kyoraku really does have it all. And that's it for the list. Apologies for the video being another lengthy one. If you're interested or just need a Cliff Notes version, I've cooked up a little graphic to show how things have changed since the last time we made this list three years ago. But that's it for the video. I really hope you enjoyed it. Let me know what you think about my list. Do you agree with it at all? Bearing in mind when we're talking about strongest and weakest, we are really taking into account an entire litany of criteria that helps make these captains who they are and makes them worthy of being a captain in the first place. But I'd love to hear your thoughts down in the comments below and your lists as well if you feel like writing them out. Make sure to hit subscribe if you haven't done already, guys. Make sure to give the video a thumbs up as well if you enjoyed it. And until next time, I'll catch you later. And I'll see you then.